A simple ketchup started an all-out industrial war, created a media house battle, and was responsible for the creation of FDA, an institution which is still responsible for the global standards on food. Today, we talk about the ketchup wars that revolutionized the food industry. Our story begins with the British doing the most British thing to do. Tea. Impressed by the flavors of the Orient, they tried to copy the most famous recipe, the catsup. Fermented fish sauce. They appropriated it and came up with tomato catsup. Tomato fermented sauce. Now at the start, tomato ketchup was as good as tea or pickles. Every house had their own recipe. From apples to anchovies. If you could think it, it would have it. The only common denominator was fermentation to make sure that the ketchup doesn't get spoiled for a long time. By the time American Civil War ended, ketchup was being mass produced and each brand boasted of their unique taste and exotic ingredients. But here came the problem. Fermentation was okay at a home level. When it came to the factories, they found that it went sour, owing to the bottling, storaging processes in the factory. Furthermore, depending on the type of ingredients used in the catsup, many a times the bottles would explode due to fermentation. Yes, eating catsup might literally kill you. At this time, when the profits of these companies were being hit, they started looking towards alternatives which were chemical preservatives, specifically benzoates. Benzoate not only kept the food from being spoiled, it also helped in enhancing the flavor of the food. Hence, companies started using benzoates as the main chemical preservative. But here's the thing. When they discovered that the benzoate would enhance taste, they started using it in bulk, trying to hide the taste of the lower quality ingredients. Leftover tomato trimmings, old moldy tomatoes, even nearly rotten ones. But benzoates when consumed in excess could cause obesity, ADHD, allergies, cancer. It could also react with the copper tubs in the factories to create salicylic acid, a poison. It was all fine. Anything was fine and there was no problem till they make their profits. In order to earn a few bucks, ketchup producers were okay with killing consumers. Thankfully, there was one person who caught this vicious scam, Dr. Harvey Wiley. A farmer by birth and having degrees in chemistry and medicine, he would become the chief of chemistry department of agriculture. And one of the first things that he did was wage war on preservatives. Being well aware of the damage and the problems unchecked use of preservatives could cause. He went on to argue that regulating the food industry was a question of survival for the entire human race. He proposed bill after bill for this, which amounted to nothing. He was rejected at each and every turn and all of his efforts had gone to waste. Till he found a support from an very unexpected source, Henry Heinz, the owner of the Heinz company. By that time, a well-known individual, renowned for his ingenuity, marketing skills and out-of-the-box thinking. How much out-of-the-box? Well, while the whole business world was trying to cut their costs by shortchanging their workforce, Heinz decided to go all in on them. Not only were the workers adequately paid, but they were also given free doctors and insurance policies. On top of that, having a clean working environment full of amenities like locker rooms, dressing rooms and dining rooms. A far cry from the dirty dinghy mess that the factories used to be at that time. But if you thought that he was a philanthropist, you were gravely mistaken. He was a businessman through and through. His welfare practices made sure that his rivals had their production stalled due to constant strikes and he would have an increased output. In a marketing genius, he opened up his factories to tourists. His ad read, we believe that our foods are the finest foods that can be made. Why not come and see whether our products are what we claim them to be? And this worked. By doing all of this, he managed to double his profits. And for this visionary, this wasn't enough. 
you could still see an opportunity there. His products had already been placed as a superior product. Now, if he would be able to make his competition pay for their lack of quality, won't the market be completely his? Soon he would have the perfect opportunity to do just that. One of his executives went ahead and attended the Pure Food Congress of 1904. He came back with a very changed mind. He preached that we need to stop using preservatives in all our food products. This, in hindsight, was the final name. If he could take out the pesticides from the food and market it as safe foods with his already high standards, the market would be his. And so the next two years would be spent to find a way around benzoate. All the while, anti-preservative movement was gaining steam in the US, mainly on the back of Wiley's and his famous poison squad. Wiley's had enlisted his colleagues' help by asking them to eat foods loaded with preservatives. And the result? Stomach cramps, headaches, sore throat, dizziness, no appetite, loss of weight, and many participants had to stop midway due to being very sick. And this attracted attention. Stories of this experiment went far and wide. People were ready for the change and Heinz brought that change. Fresh ripe tomatoes, lots of vinegars and twice as much as salt and sugar as other commercial ketchups. The result was a thick sweet vinegary syrup which could outlive its benzoate rival. But due to the quality and quantity of the ingredients used, the output cost could be twice or thrice its competition. Heinz needed to find a way to justify his prices. Hence came the sudden support for Dr. Wiley's bill, the Pure Food and Drug Act, a law that would regulate the food quality of a product and the preservatives used in the food processing industry. This was the same bill that Dr. Wiley's was trying to get passed in the parliament for the last 15 years. Even in 1906, the chance of this bill being passed were non-existent. The president and the parliament were dead set against it until that meeting where Dr. Wiley and three Heinz executives met the president on a one-on-one -on -one meeting and Dr. Wiley came prepared. He gave the president a report about his favorite scotch, how many preservatives were in that scotch, and what kind of damage that scotch was going to cause to him. The president changed his mind. Not for the pure foods as much, but surely for the purity of the drinks that he was having. But the deed was done. The bill was passed on 23rd June 1906, essentially creating the Food and Drug Administration that we know of today as the gold standard of food quality. But this victory came at a price. In order to secure enough votes, they had to give certain concessions. So preservatives were not completely banned, but allowed in small amounts. That meant that Heinz's original idea of taking over the complete market would not come to fruition. But he was not discouraged by that. Instead, he doubled down on his efforts. The Heinz company, who had barely spent any money on advertising their ketchup, suddenly launched a massive advertisement campaign for their ketchup, targeting the dangerous chemicals in the food. Heinz had sent warning shots. He was going after them and it was going to be a war. And the benzoate lobby was not going to take it sitting idly. They went to the president arguing that Heinz claims had no actual scientific backing. In fact, an anti-benzoate law would destroy the ketchup industry. There was a widespread publication of articles stating that after the preservatives were introduced in the ketchup, the bottles stopped exploding. In response to this line of attack, Wiley hired chemists to research the Heinz ketchup and disprove these accusations. And the fight went on. Finally, the president intervened because he got tired of the bickering. He ordered an independent probe into benzoate as a preservative. The result being, benzoate was harmless if you consumed less than half a gram per day. Essentially, this was a drop. Both sides got something. 
but by this point a draw was unacceptable one side had to give in so 1909 would see heinz himself taking the stage talking about his reasons for turning against other manufacturers and the war continued the next few years both sides would throw outlandish accusations at each other by 1911 the victor was decided maybe supplemented by the constant crackdowns of the fda maybe because of the open factory policy of the heinz or maybe because of the popular food french fries and hamburgers which required their sauce to be thick heinz had won they had taken over majority of the market despite being at a higher price point suddenly the ketchup company had nothing to rely on they had no backup recipe they were suffering heavy losses and they were fighting for their survival so to stop the bleeding the entire industry decided to copy heinz's recipe of ketchup which meant there was no other flavor in ketchup except for one in the time they figured out some other flavors for the ketchup the flavor of the ketchup itself was so entrenched in the american culture that any other flavor was just rejected it it just doesn't taste like ketchup that's what they said and so in a war fought across the american landscape a war for health or for greed a war which created the quality standard that world even follows today there was one innocent victim the ketchup which was forever destined to be one one color one texture one consistency and one taste i hope you found this story interesting thank you for watching